train. Jump on the steam train. We real estate disruptors. Hey everybody, thank you for joining us for today's episode of Real Estate Disruptors. Today we've got Benson Juarez with Privy, and Benson flew in from Denver to share how to use local market data to locate deals automatically. Now I am on a mission to create 100 millionaires. The information on this podcast alone is enough to help you become a millionaire in the next five to seven years. If you'll take consistent action, you will become one. These days I've been hearing a lot of people saying things like my acquisition guys aren't buying deep enough. Our dispo guys can't sell our deals anymore. If you're hearing things like this, we might be able to help text leaders to 33777 see if my team can help you with that. Uh, this show is brought to you by our company, Investor Lift. Get access to over 2 million cash buyers across the country. Use uh, disruptors to get 10% off of, at InvestorLift.com. If you get value today, please share this episode right now. Tag a friend below. That way we can all grow together. And don't forget, we do have part in the disruption tomorrow and certainty talks on Friday. And this is a live show. So please ask your questions for Benson to answer. You ready? Ready. All right. So first question is, what was your life like before real estate? Well, I've always been an entrepreneur. So I've, I've always been looking for some sort of a hustle to get involved with. And before real estate, I was in kind of a transition period um, because it was right before, like 9-11, it just happened. And so at the time I was... Uh, in the National Guard for the Air Force. I was military police. And so I, I just finished a stint with another company that I built for six years. It was a retail nutrition store company called uh, One on One Nutrition. And uh, I was transitioned out of that and I decided to go back to school to get a master's degree in business so I could just figure out what I was going to do next. Yeah. And then 9-11 happened and then I got thrown into like the opposite of entrepreneurship, which is working for the government. Yeah. And then I started to do my side hustle while I was at the base and doing my active duty, which was like learning real estate and slinging mortgage loans and hard money loans. And that's how I moved forward into the real estate. So it was kind of a weird time before getting into real estate where mm -hmm. I was like, you know, to the max, working for the government, doing business school, and then leaving a business that I had sold. So it's so a one on one on one nutrition. One on one nutrition. Kind of like, is that kind of like a GNC and a stop one or, or one stop? Nutrition kind of deal? Yeah. You go and you buy nutrients and whatever. Yeah, nutritional products that what we thought was different, which hadn't been done a lot. Now it is done a lot because of the internet. It's easier, was the consultation element. So they Got would it. come in and they'd get like a workout program and they'd get a nutrition, you know, list and, mm. and meal plans. And so that's how we kind of tied it together was to give the consultation with the products themselves. You were involved in it, involved in what capacity? I was the owner. You were the owner. Yeah. And being the owner, you went from that to working for the government. To that, well, to knowing that the internet revolution was coming and knowing that that was the competition to like, okay, I don't want to be sitting in a retail environment anymore. I'm going to go back to college, figure out what the heck's going on in the world. And then 9-11 happened. Yeah. And then boom, out of base. Got it. What compelled you to, Join the National Guard. To pay for school. Okay. So pay it was to help school. pay for college was mm -hmm. you agreed to this. And then you got introduced into a war that you had no idea was happening. That was going to happen. Right. Yeah. But that was always, you just never know right. when that's gonna ha that sort of thing is going to happen. But I, I liked the aspect of get some money, but also like the experiences that came out of it. So um, my brother actually ended up joining with the same um, – group I was in. Mm -hmm. And so we would actually volunteer for all kinds of, of deployments. So got I got, it. I got, went, I went to uh, the Caribbean twice. Uh, I went to um, Italy, Germany. Um, and then when we did the, the full like active duty that we didn't have a choice of where we went at that point. Right. And then I was in Kosovo for the majority of that deployment. Okay. And then during this time you're doing loans and you said, Private, uh, you were doing mortgages and uh, private loans or hard money loans? Yeah, so it didn't start off right away. However, I was at the base. We would do 12-hour um, shifts. Mm -hmm. So you do like three 12s, and then you'd have like two days off or three days off. And sometimes those days off would be right in the middle of the week. And so me being kind of a hustler and a entrepreneur, I wasn't just going to sit around for three days. So I'm like, well, what could I do with this time? And I had a buddy that was – 
doing mortgages. And so I'm like, well, you know, can you teach me how to do this? And so I was pretty soon spending more time doing that than I was time at the base, mm -hmm. but all during the day. Cause I was starting the base work at night to 12 or actually 6 PM to 6 AM. Okay. I'd go home and sleep for a few hours and I'd go sell loans, sleep for another couple hours and then go back to the base. Where were you selling loans? Just to people I knew, just my, my sphere of influence. But these are people that are looking to buy houses at this time. And even though you were a different part of the, were you a different part of the world? No. Well, it depends on what point it was. At mm -hmm. that point in time, I was in Colorado. Okay. So you're in Colorado. At, at our ba base there. You were doing loans for people buying homes in Colorado? Mm hmm Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So you you a side hustle doing mortgages. And then you say hard money loans? Hard money loans eventually. How did you get into hard money loans? It's the office that I was in. It was this weird office called Money Tree. Okay. And um, they, they had a title company there. They worked with a lot of investors. They did hard money loans. They brokered hard money loans. So they were just integrating at all levels. Gotcha. A lot of people were licensed as agents and doing mortgages. And so it's just like a lot going on. It was and, a, little, um, a little bit more Wild West before Dodd-Frank came around. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I eventually got licensed as an agent. I'm still mm -hmm. licensed. When they, when they made me choose which to do, yeah. it was agency work. Okay. And then somewhere along the way, so you're already heavily involved in real estate. Somewhere along the way, you got involved with clout. Yeah. What was that? So clout was, uh, I've done annual investing is what they call it, right? So you just, you invest in, in technology companies or mm -hmm. startups. And um, I found a, a company that was a fintech or financial technology company um, from a, a buddy of mine that I went to college with who was in the same business school as me. And so he had this, concept of uh, merchant funded rewards think about what Rakuten is now if you've heard of it what is it Rakuten I'm not familiar with it um I think I'm pronouncing it right it's basically like a uh, a rewards based system where if you buy a certain product you buy a promotion you can get VIP you know rewards you can Got get it. gifts you can get cash back it didn't exist then mm -hmm. and so we were kind of like I think we were a little bit ahead of our time, um, but Clout was basically a merchant-funded rewards program where you could get, you know, cash back, VIP access to things, special promotions, and um, I'm trying to think—is this something I saw like on like um, Shark Tank or like um, there was a? I was like, and you you can get into special clubs in New York, right? Um, like if you had this card, right? Yeah, but this is this is LA based. When you we were going to be based out of it. That's where we were doing it. So mm -hmm. I actually picked up and moved to Los Angeles for four years. Got it. As we worked on that. Okay. And then when did you start investing in real estate? That would have been 2003 or four. Okay. 2002, three or four. All right. So you've been investing in real estate this whole time. So even though you were, you had, you know, you you want to get your master's degree in business and you went to military you were investing this whole time? No. So sequentially, when I went back to, to college, that would have been like summer of 2001. Okay. I, I just done all of the GMAT work and done all the studying, like learning how to learn again. Um, and then once I got accepted into business school, then 9-11 um, happened, right, shortly thereafter. And then I was right back into the military. And then I had a time frame where I was learning real estate mm -hmm. and loans and all that sort of thing. And then, you know, three or four is when I started to start investing in real estate. Got it. Okay. And then, um, was there, you can tell me about like your first deal because you were doing this. Sounds crazy, right? Cause it's like almost 20 years ago. It's like, it was a different era. Mm -hmm. Tell me what it was like investing in real estate back then. Well, it was much easier to get a loan. Mm -hmm. So they had, <laughs> yes. No doc loans, right? <laughs> yeah. And so stated income loans, basically you could just say how much you made and it could be owner occupied or non-owner occupied type loans. Mm -hmm. um, so the criteria is different. Like I said before, Dodd-Frank, everything was just a different, it was like a wild, wild west. Um, you could actually go and you could talk to the appraiser. I remember those days. When you show up, when they do the appraisal. You, go, you, you can go yell at the appraiser like, yo, like, I don't know, get your head out of your butt. Like this yeah. is wrong value. Totally. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and we had our appraisers. Right? Uh -huh. Everybody had their appraisers that they used. Right. Mm -hmm. You had relationships with them. And so, 
you know, right or wrong, probably more wrong. Um, a lot of undue influence. Yep. You know, things are, things are better now. Also, there was like, uh, you know, subprime loans then, right? So you get mm-hmm. really low interest rates, um, arms, you know, adjustable rate mortgages. It was just a different game then. Right. Um, so things, yeah, they have changed considerably. But you were buying deals in Colorado? In Colorado. Okay. So were you, you were buying deals predominantly to hold to, um, to keep as rentals? That was some of it. It, it really de- depended. Like I actually started off doing that and then I learned how to wholesale by accident. Okay. Tell me about that. By getting, well, by getting to a property that like just didn't fit my, my buy box at that point, like mm-hmm. coming across a deal and be like, oh, this is great. And then figuring out like, oh, it's got too much work. Like some of these properties we would buy sight unseen. So we were, we were uh, going through and doing, uh, buying doing a foreclosure list. And we had this really cool software at the time that was pulling in public record data. And then we were able to kind of find uh, properties that were in foreclosure and we could see, we'd pull, um, we had a relationship with a title company and they'd pull O&Es for us and we could see which ones had liens. Hang on, O&Es? Mm-hmm. Ownership and encumbrance. Okay. So that's like a modified title, you know, pulling a title that a title company sure. would do. Okay. And back then you could, they could just give them to you for free. So this is another thing that regulators changed is mm-hmm. the title companies can't give you anything anymore because now they're earning your business and they're regulated. So that's right. frowned upon. Value. Sure. Yeah. So we're just getting like hundreds of these things. And so we're just pulling liens and then we would get, we'd go out and we'd buy like an HOA lien or we'd buy like a municipality lien. And at the time that um, there was a redemption, 45 day redemption period for foreclosure. So we go buy a lien and now we're in a redemption line. Mm-hmm. So this is also the time when they were doing a lot of 80, 20 loans. Right. So 80% first, 20% second, so you can avoid paying the private mortgage insurance. And um, so they would start the redemption process and there'd be like, you know, three or four liens on this property. And then the redemption process would start and they, the first mortgage would always get their money. Sure. Second mortgage comes up and they're like, well, we're not in the business of owning real, real estate. So we're going to just walk away. So, that 20% lien just disappears, poof, in, in the thin air. Mm-hmm. And then it goes to the third one. Maybe it's a HELOC or, you know, some sort of, you know, other equity line of credit. And then it comes down to the lien holder. So I got a $100 HOA lien that I paid 50 bucks for. And all I got to do is pay off the first mortgage. Mm-hmm. And now whatever equity that was there before, I get that minus whatever the other lien holders they walked away from that didn't redeem. Got it. And that was my whole strategy. So I was knocking on doors. I knocked on hundreds of doors. Um, but when they would come down to the auction, we would just, you know, write offers. And uh, we got a lot of properties that way. Got it. It was fun. Uh, do you sell properties that you bought back then? Did I sell them? You, or did you sell them or do you still have them? Oh, they're all gone. They're all gone. Yeah. Okay. The 7 to 11 crunch kind of. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so talk a little bit about that because right now we've got a little bit of a little bit of this um, interesting market right now. Mm -hmm. And there are people that have been through this who might be suffering a little PTSD. Right. There are people that have not gone through this and have no idea what's going on. Yeah. And there are other people that have gone through two of these and they're like, I'm excited for this third one, right? Yeah. What is your take and what are you doing in this market? I fit more in the latter of those different scenarios Mm -hmm. because – you know, I was talking earlier to your team and they were asking about one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made. And it was, it was being unprepared for those downturns mm-hmm. in the market. And so part of the, what the strategies were that we were using at the time when we were buying properties, is we were doing the Burr approach. So we'd, we'd fix it up, turn them into rentals, but then we'd refinance them and take all the cash out that they would give us. Were you calling them Burrs back then? No, we weren't. Yeah. Yeah, we weren't okay. calling them Burrs. I don't know what we called them. <laughs> all right. But anyway. But and then we take that money and do another one, right? So all these properties were, were leveraged to the max. But then we just had like a good model of just acquiring more and more real estate, the cash flowed. But then as soon as the dip came, mm-hmm. the values took a hit. Then, you know, there was also, you know, unemployment rose. We had vacancies. You know, we were taking a hit on cash flow. And then um, the market just took a crap, right? So we had to figure out a way to manage that. And, um we lost properties through foreclosure. Uh, I actually had a business partner who was my partner in the mortgage company that I started um, at the time. 
who decided to just up and leave and take our entire bank account balance with her. It was over $100,000 that we had for our rental properties for you know, maintenance. And it was just like our reserve account and just stole it, disappeared. Wow. Were there any legal, legal ramifications for her? There wasn't. For, for many years, we didn't even know where she was. Uh, Got it. We eventually figured out where she was. And, you know, we talked to some lawyers and they're like, you know, statute of limitations. She was an owner in the company. The, it was her the operating money. agreement allows her to do that. It, right. Right. And I don't even remember. I, I think it was just a regular partnership. Yeah. But generally speaking, the operating agreement right, allows either parties to like empty the bank account to, for, the, for business purposes. Right. So I was stuck with all yeah. the mortgages. And that's what I actually had brought to the table because Got she it. was one of the w women that I met at that mortgage company who, while I was actually on, at the base, we, we started this mortgage company like right as I was leaving. Like I was, went right from active duty into like owning a mortgage company. Mm -hmm. And then we went right into doing all these real estate deals. Yeah. And that was the strategy. And it was working for a long time and we were doing well. And um, then the downturn came and, you know, so if she didn't take the hundred k. Would would you sell those properties? We I lost them all through foreclosure. Right, but if she didn't take that, would you still have those properties? I don't know. Because for a long time, I was I was paying the mortgages out of my own pocket, mm -hmm. but I realized I was just fueling the fire, and maybe I wasn't. I was like digging my way out. I was just prolonging the inevitable. Yeah, and so maybe I would have figured that same thing out, right? If I had the money. And, Got it. and not taking it as far as I did with my own cash. Knowing what you know now, would you start a mortgage company again? No. No? I don't, like, I, don't like the, I don't like the model. It's just, there's so much competition out there now. And then, you know, with, with the regulation and the rates and I don't know. I, I wouldn't. Yeah, we had there, Daniel, there's better ways to spend money. Uh, we had Daniel Marcos here uh, a few weeks ago. And... Uh, he sold his or shut down his his mortgage company back. I want to say around two thousand seven. And his partners were shocked. They're like, "Why are you shutting this down?" Because I hate working with realtors. Like, okay, well then that's it. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so you're you're putting yourself in the latter position where you are excited for this market. Yeah. And you're prepared for this market. Better prepared. What did you do to prepare for this market? I think it was just time. Really, it's just that I've been in the business longer now, so I I know. What, you know how to pivot and mm -hmm. I won't react uh, as um, what's the word I, I won't be as reactive when things happen like I'll just know like okay it's not the end of the world like, mm -hmm. if something happens it doesn't mean it's the end of the world and you know, I'll know how to better make you know, better decisions during certain things um, but also then I didn't really fully understand it I'm still learning but like the whole like seller financing and creative deal structures like I didn't yeah. I didn't know any of that back then None of us did. Yeah. yeah. And so now with properties that have very little equity, there's still, there's still a way to make money on those. Right. And so that to me is, is another tool in the toolbox that I had no clue about mm -hmm. back then. Um, but also now more, you know, access to more money, right? Like I've got investors now. Like if I need to put a deal together, I can go find a private investor and make it happen. Right. Back then, the only access to the money I had was through conventional means. Yeah, just through the banks. Right, just and banks. They, and they had no more money. Right. All right, so you're better better access to capital, more skills in the tool belt. Yep. Uh, what are you foreseeing happening in this market? I think it's going to be much different than it was the first time around. And I think mostly because everybody learned that process, banks being one of them. Yeah. So, now you're going to see a lot more loan modifications. You're going to see a lot more, um, you know, short sales. They're going to take a lot less properties back through the full foreclosure process and then become REOs than back then, mm -hmm. which is where a lot of the good inventory came from, right? Was from banks. And so um, I think that's going to be the major difference a lot less REO inventory. Yeah. But what that will create is more opportunities for people who are working direct with seller to be able to structure some subject to deals or seller finance deals if they can, you know, cure the, the delinquency yep. and get it out of foreclosure so they can stop those proceedings. Um, if you can figure that out, that niche in your local market, because every market's different, mm -hmm. all, the, all the county or, uh, you know, state rules are different. 
with you know what you have to disclose and even as much i mean this is even you know five or six years ago like if a house went into foreclosure in colorado like you had to like a certain size font and certain things had to be in bold and like there's so much regulation now yeah. about protecting consumers like if you can figure that out with the whole foreclosure timeline where can you insert yourself into that timeline to be able to you know buy a lien or help somebody out but i think also the key is is um not approaching it from the simple fact that you can make money but you can help somebody out of a bad a bad problem yeah right so just i uh, want to touch on this because i think this is a great great point right preparing for this so that's actually something i've been doing as well so you know i've reached out to multiple lenders getting myself prepared right so that mm -hmm. you know if people are sub two or buying their property sub two we need to get their mortgage current because they're going through financial distress lining myself up with private investors to be in that situation right so mm -hmm. family offices uh people with access to big capital so on so if you guys are listening and you guys want to be part of this journey right we are looking for money to cure these people right on their helping them get current on their uh not helping them get current but helping pay off what they're behind so that we can help them move on with their with their uh with their lives yeah if you can stop the timeline yeah that'll buy you time to figure out the rest of it right so that's like the first thing once you do that then okay we got some breathing room we're not we're not feel like you know things are going to close in on us um at that point you can come up with something that's that's more of a win-win and not just so reactive and they're like you know making a decision and truly being in a situation where they can be taken advantage of right like that's what a lot of people out there you know predatory people are are taking advantage of these people yep so somewhere along the way you decided to launch a software product what compelled you to launch a product it's it's a long story but as a result of the downturn i kind of had to recreate myself mm -hmm. right so you know obviously we i took an ego hit from you know losing all those properties and thinking like hey what am i going to do next well i was still licensed as an agent um i was still actually able to do i think i was still able to actually be able to do mortgages at the time so what i i found was there was an opportunity to align myself with um REO brokerages. Mm -hmm. So there were certain brokerages that had already established bank relationships and they had the, this flow of properties coming from the banks. And you just see these REO signs all up, all up all, all over the whole city. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, I, I wanted to go and get in with those companies. So I just figured out who the, all those were. And I, I went and I hung my license with a company that was doing a significant amount of listings for HUD and Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and then, you know, a lot of other, you know, major banks. And just to me, like, listen, don't give me anything. All I want to do is just, I just want to manage all of the deals that call, that come in off these signs. Yeah. All the, so I just Smart. created like a really good CRM follow-up system. And I just nurtured all those leads and turned them into clients. Sooner or later, another guy joins the office. His name's Scott Fall. Mm -hmm. He's my business partner currently. And so we sat across the way from each other in these cubicles and we would just BS all day and we'd be on the phone hustling and doing deals and just going out and showing properties. And, um, you know, he had this really good approach. It was more of a systematic approach that, than I was doing where he was analyzing all the deals every day and creating almost like a hot sheet of like these deals. And he would yeah. call his top investors. He was building a buyer's list through all these people who were calling in. And, um, you know, and we're just throwing ideas around, right? And we're like, man, what if we could automate that, mm -hmm. right? Be able to, to really just automate it because we were, as much as people think that the MLS is like the holy grail of data, it's just a deep, dark hole that you get lost in when you go in there and you try to run comps or analyze deals. It's not designed for real estate investing. Yeah. So that the idea of Privy was born out of what we were facing every day, which is- so we, If we could automate this, what is this? Was automate what? Automate the process of finding, analyzing, tracking investment properties. Okay. All right. And that was only just in the Denver market. Yeah. Right. So, um, you know, for a while it was just more of a concept and, um, you know, that the idea developed even further. And this is about the same time that where I was still doing angel investing. Right. So I had invested a, a chunk of money into clout out in Los Angeles. And um, my business partner there, 
um, raised a bunch of cash. And he was like, listen, we, I want you to come out to LA. And, you know, things were going decently in Colorado, but I'm like, I can be a, you know, I can be a, you know, the a next big tech startup. Mm -hmm. Right. So I moved out there. And so I was, you know, trying to figure out what I was going to be doing. And at the same time, I'm talking with my partner, Scott now, and he's like, things are looking really good on, on the privy side. So I'm like, okay, so here's some money. Right. So invested in that. Yeah. And I'm like, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to do this thing here in, in, in California. I'm going to, I'm going to see it through. And the whole time I'm talking to Scott. Right. And then at some point he's like, okay, we found this amazing developer. We've got, you know, the, the, we got all the parts to be able to push this thing forward. And, um, and I was getting really kind of just over with, with the cloud situation mm -hmm. personalities, right? You're always working with people and you've got an amazing culture here. We talked about that earlier. Yeah, thank you. I've been unfortunate to be able to be in some really bad cultural situations sure. when it comes to people in offices. Um, but that's just, that's just life. Right. So, um, but eventually, you know, Privy was really starting to take off. And, um, I talked, when to was Scott. this? Cause you're talking about REO, you were working with buyers in REO days. So when mm -hmm. did you start Privy? Privy was started really in like 2010. Wow. So this is a 12 year project. Yeah. Okay. All right. I had no idea when back that far. All right. So go ahead. So, continue. But the thing is, is like it was never intended to be sold as a product, mm -hmm. right? It was just intended to be a, a solution to a approach. problem that you guys had. Right. Yeah. That's how Which most software the, starts. Right. And it's the best way, right? Because, yeah. well, it, it actually isn't the way most software starts. It's most not. people have these ideas. The right way for software to start. Yes. The, and the way that we're successful ones are born out of. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we, had, we were solving a problem, mm -hmm. right? And so... And while I was doing my stuff in, in California and, and Scott was out here grinding, you know, building a team and kind of getting it off the ground, eventually he came to a point where he's like, dude, we're, we're ready to go. Like, I, I want you back in, Col in Colorado. And um, I'm like, I'm ready. I'm ready. So came back. And so now since like 2014, 15, Ben, you know, was advising for a couple of years and then finally operational and so we've been just been grinding for the last six, seven years, taking it from a, a product that was just in a couple cities with only MLS data to l last year, really just launching nationwide was our, when we bought nationwide data mm -hmm. and being able to do this in the entire United States. Got it. Um, you said Scott was a partner. Anyone else help you along the way? Cause it's like, it's a long journey. Right, mm -hmm. go from starting in 2010 as an idea to where you are today. Who yeah. are some significant people that helped you along the way? Man, several people. I, I think our main one was is our our developer Doug. Mm -hmm. His name's Doug Hayes. He's just he, an amazing developer. He, for many many years, he handled everything from all the, all the back end database development to the front end U, UI, like the, the yeah. graphical you know, user interface. That's how talented he is. And while I was in, while I was doing clout out in Los Angeles, you know, we had development teams that had 10 to 15 people on them and we outsourced all those overseas. And I won't tell you where those people are from, but Doug can do the work of 10 to 15 people that we outsourced from overseas yeah, and way better. And just, Oh God, it's, it's, it's worlds of difference. Outsourcing is one of those things that sounds wonderful. Yeah. But my understanding of software is there's a lot of overlap and redundant work because it's really difficult to communicate exactly what it is you want and they move slower and they don't understand because they're not in the same room as you and communication, there are communication challenges, mm -hmm. but I have my understanding with software, it can become very over, overrated very quickly because of the challenges as you run into it. Um, so Absolutely. before we continue here, there's a couple of things I want to touch on. So you were working as a buyer agent at REO Brokerages. Mm -hmm. so you were working with a lot of clients. Oh, yeah. Because we don't really, I don't see it here anywhere in your bio, which makes sense because, you know, maybe you don't want to brag about being a realtor. <laughs> but you were a high performing realtor at some point then. Is, oh, yeah. Is what I'm taking from this here. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm asking this question. Because right now we're doing Dispo sales training, right? Within right. Our, uh, as part of our disruptor sales disruptors, you know, brand offering. 
we're working with a lot of people to how, how to have effective conversations with investors to sell your deals. And what I'm digging into, because the last few years, right, it's order taking. You didn't have to be really that good. What I'm really digging into for the bag of tricks is really the conversations I used to have as a realtor. Right? I had the buyer consult ask you to come in and figure mm-hmm. out what's important to you, right? But, but back in the day, you come to my office, like, hey, what's important to you? I want to be this three bedroom, two bath, this city, blah, 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 right? I was like, perfect. I got a lender for you and I connect you with my loan officer. And then as you're looking for bids, I connect you with my contractor. Yeah. And then after everything's done, you know, there's a home warranty, here's a handyman, right? Like, and maybe a Home Depot gift card, right? Along the way. Like, this is kind of like the buyer agent experience. Yeah. Today, as a dispo uh, rep, I see a lot of similarities. Like, hey, Benson, what's important to you? What are you looking to buy? What's like, why are you buying? Why are you flipping? What are you hoping to accomplish? Right. We're going into your why. And by the way, here's a hard money lender. So <laughs> we send you our deals. Mm-hmm. And here's a general contractor for your flips. So I, I feel like all those same conversations, you know, back we used to say, hey, you know, why do, you, why do I need to come in your, your office, Steve? It's like, well, I want to make sure, Benson, that we don't miss out on one of your perfect, op- you know, perfect properties, right? If I don't know exactly what you're looking for, we might miss out on your dream home. And I was like, okay, I'll come to your office, right? Right. I had to sell the appointment. Mm-hmm. And today, like, just send me your deals. Like, no, I'm not going to send you my deals because I'm going to send you deals. You're going to ignore them. Like, how will I know if I'm sending you the right deals if you and I can't have a conversation? Absolutely. So I'm looking here at, like, the dispo agent, the buyer agent, like, all those conversations. I'm having PTSD, by the way, like, when I do, do these uh, <laughs> trainings, right? But, I mean, are you seeing these same, same similarities here? Oh, yeah. So I'm yeah, make sure I'm not crazy. Very much so. I mean, well, you're talking about dispo, but I think even like on the acquisition, it's the same thing. Mm-hmm. Because you know, I was talking with your team and they were thinking about like, how do we you know, communicate with people through the holidays and make sure that we're still kind of staying top of mind. That's like when the, you know, what agents used to do with, you know, like the Brian Buffini oh, yeah. system, right? Where like, oh, how do I stay top of mind? You call them every so often. It's on about the follow up. And, um, I'm like, what are you guys doing for anything for Christmas? Like, you could, you know, send them cookies or a candy bag or a gift bag. Like, most most acquisition people aren't doing that. Like, nope. How are you going to separate yourself from that stack of postcards that are sitting on their kitchen table? And they all look the same. Maybe one's mm-hmm. got like a photo on it now, and it's been written with a computer signature, mm-hmm. you know, a, an arm or something, send right? Out cards. Yep. And so, how are you going to do something different? And so, it it is a lot of this stuff that we're doing right now came from agents. They've yeah. been perfecting it for 30 years. Right. It's all relationship building. So it's really fascinating because like, I'm seeing like now that things are getting a little harder, where we have to dig into the bag of tricks. Like we've been using, we've been using psychology for, for a while, but now we're going to have to actually uh, provide more service. The other thing too, you're saying you're in Denver and you're dealing with all these, all these REO brokerages. Did mm-hmm. you know that asset management companies were in Denver? Some of them were. I don't a know. A lot of them were. So... When you say Denver, I spent a lot of time in Denver getting drunk, right? So what had to happen <laughs> was I had to fly into Denver, okay, right, where all the asset managers are hanging out, I find out where they like to drink, we go get drinks, buy the, um, uh, get bottle service, right, and get them drunk, right? Like that's what where I did you take to, them? Do you remember? Whatever bars were in Denver, right? Like I remember mm-hmm. walking down. It's um, is a 16th Street Mall? Yep. Right. I remember like. Stumbling back on 16th Street Mall, right, from the clubs into my hotel room, right, and then, you know, <laughs> going to these conferences at 6 a.m., or waking up at 6 a.m. to go to these conferences, the REO conferences, yeah, and then starting all over again. But what always happened, if I took a banker to get bottle service, when I got back home to Phoenix, I always got new REO listings, right? It's clockwork. Yep. So when you were saying Denver, I was just wondering, because you're dealing with, you're in Denver, and you're working with REO brokerages. If you knew they were all in your backyard, I I wasn't that close to the servicers or the banks. Um, yeah, I, I didn't get that far. Yeah, but I built amazing relationships so much so that, like, I was helping other brokerages. Like, I had a handful of other brokerages that I would do theirs too, and we just had commission split right. agreements. And so, you know, I'm, I'm kind of picturing some faces right now, but. I, the one I was I was with the longest was um, the Mercury Alliance, and I was with another one, who we're still friends today, which was the Blake team. Her mm-hmm. name's Lisa Blake. She's a a big agent out there. She does a lot of work, and um, she's still really tied in with a bunch of servicers. Yeah, right. And and actually, she's one of the people I've been talking to a lot lately to figure out like, well, what's going on behind the scenes? And that's one of the things that she told me is that 
about the banks being way better prepared. Oh yeah. Six months ago, maybe longer than that, eight months ago, she's like, banks are hiring a lot of people right now. Mm -hmm. They're hiring a lot of staff to bring on to help during like this, um, what was it, the moratorium, right? Like the mortgage moratorium. Sure. And the CARES Act was in place and they had the whole plan on how it was gonna work out. But even after the CARES Act ended, banks were still changing how they were gonna start the foreclosure process. They had to be way, way more lenient on how they did it. Like they had to do more workout programs than ever before and they were planning for that. So they needed more people, more staff. And so they're, yeah, they're way more prepared than they ever were yeah. in the past. And we're hearing the same thing too, where someone was asking, I was at a real estate panel and uh, we had the, the chief economist for Fannie Mae on the panel. Someone asked like, what, what are you guys doing now? Like, how is this different than last time? Like, oh, it's really easy. We're prepared this time. Like, we didn't have 2007 last time. <laughs> right. So yeah, they were, and we got a chance to work through all those systems. So um, what exactly does Privy do? It, it's a hard question to answer sure. succinctly because we do a lot of different things. Um, what I will say is that we do a lot of things that most companies don't do. Okay, so one of the things that makes us different is that we've got direct to MLS data contracts. So um, I'm happy to announce that we just launched the Phoenix market, the greater Phoenix market. Good, because I was beating you up on that last time we talked. You were, and it was a goal of mine to get that done for you uh, and your team because there's such a, a high demand of, I, I call Phoenix the wholesale capital of the world, mm -hmm. because there's just so much going on here. People still love it, yeah. and that's great. Um, However, it's, it's one of many that we are working on. So we're currently, we're approaching 70 direct to MLS data markets with That's huge. That, that direct to MLS data, which is, what, why is it important? Well, it's updated more often than any other, any other data source. You've got status updates, price changes, you get access to uh, information before it gets to the county. Mm -hmm. So like if a house is fixed and flips and sells today and the agent reports that back to the MLS and they put it as sold, I mean, in Maricopa County, it might be three weeks before they even know that that thing's sold, mm -hmm. right? Because they're so delayed and the county just, they are who they are. And every county is different. But my users will know about it an hour within if they're, if, if they're actually going and look, Yeah, right? That's a huge advantage to be able to really lock in that up-to-date information and know the value is today. Because in a shifting market, like if you don't have your finger on the pulse, you're going to make a mistake and you're going to be making a decision based off of data that's old or right. inaccurate. And again, in a business where everything's based off of numbers, if you're off 5% on either direction on your value, that, that's the difference between you making and losing money. Well, not just making or losing money, also maybe not getting the deal. If your numbers are wrong, mm -hmm. right, and someone else has better data, they might buy it because they know more than you do. I mean, one of the best flips I've had was just – Total happenstance. I just knew that neighborhood better than other people, right? Right. Like, there's just, just one part within this uh, square block that it's all semi-custom built. Just this one, just one little subdivision that's all semi-custom in an attract neighborhood, right? But if you were just, if you didn't know that area, you would pass in that deal. But we bought it off the auction block, right? And mm -hmm. killed it because we were willing to bid more than anybody else yeah. because we knew that neighborhood better than anybody else. I call that local market intelligence. Yeah. And that's the other thing that we do that no other platform does. So we're tracking all the investment properties as they're happening in real time. Mm -hmm. So I can come into any market or I can do this nationwide. Let's say you're trying to choose a market because you're just, you're tired of Phoenix and you want to start looking someplace else. Well, where do you go? Well, the first th thing people think is like, okay, well, where do I have boots on the ground? Mm -hmm. Where does my uncle live? You know, where do I go to college? Yeah. Where do I vacation? Right, thinking that that boots on the ground is going to make a significant difference in their ability to execute in that market, which is funny you say that because that is definitely the thinking process, but not how we should be making that decision. Right, but it, it so here's the thing: that's that's definitely a benefit if it aligns with the what the data tells you. Yeah. First, so we look at the data, and I can I can show you on a map every single fix and flip that happened in the last twelve months. Okay. Um, and why I bring up fix and flips, it's not because you have to do fix and flips, but the majority of the time we measure how good a deal is mm -hmm. based off of a percentage of ARV, right? So the lower the percentage, the better the deal is. And if you're trying to make a property into a deal, if you operate in an area where there's high investor activity, it's going to be easier for you to assemble all of the pieces you need to turn that into a deal because you literally can't prove after repair value on a house 
if you have no renovated comps. Right. So don't spend time looking for properties in areas where there's not investor activity because you don't have all the essential ingredients for building a deal. And you're fighting an uphill battle when you do flip it. Right. Absolutely. Right. Because if eventually, and this is what we tell people, you think several steps down the line. Yeah. Right. It's like the seven habits of highly effective people. The second habit is begin with the end in mind. Mm-hmm. And if you're thinking about, okay, if I go and I can find a property in this neighborhood, I just say I can't. Is there data around there that's going to help me prove after a pair value to a, a buyer? Or if you're a buyer, an, an appraiser. Yep. And if you think like that and you recognize and be you're honest with yourself, well, yeah, there's no one flipping in there. Then don't waste your time looking for properties there. I mean, this is such a great point because I've made this mistake, right? Like I flipped a house and it was the nicest house in the neighborhood by far, but there were no remodeled comps. Mm-hmm. So all the comps were like, Homes that hadn't been updated. So I got a $10,000 bump over every other house. Like, I just spent $60,000 making this house look beautiful. They only give me $10,000 credit. Well, there's no data right. to support your after repair value. It's like, this sucks. That's but a that's hard too, lesson to learn. Hard lesson to learn. That's, that, but that's your point here. It is. It's, and it's, it's so fundamental to the business and how it works. Logical when you but think about it. But nobody teaches it. <laughs> yeah. And I say nobody. You, I don't hear it very often. Right. What you do hear a lot about is, oh, here's which list you should buy. Here's the, how you should skip trace. Here's the script you should be cold calling with. Here's the CRM you should be using. It's all about lead gen. Mm-hmm. And then what happens? They get a lead. They look at it, and they don't know if it's a deal or not. Yeah. Because they don't know what a deal looks like. Right. And a deal in Phoenix is not the same thing as a deal is in Philadelphia or in Dallas or in Denver. It's different everywhere. And in this shifting market, it's ever more important that you actually are tracking activity as it happens in real time so you can see where the shift is. So I can show you specifically which neighborhood you should be buying in. Mm-hmm. And then you can look around and be like, okay, here's the last 10 deals that closed in the you know, past month. They bought it for this much. They sold it for this much. They bought it at this percentage of ARV. Here's who the buyer is. Here's who their agent was. Here's the before and after pictures. So we're, we're filling an educational gap that has never been able to be filled before. There's a lot of really good education and coaches and mentoring and theory there. Mm-hmm. And then there's the nuts and bolts of getting the deal done. In the middle is the local market intelligence. Yeah. Well, and the I real this, estate education. You're, you're making uh, decisions based off of data, not uh, theory. And so mm-hmm. one of the things that we see a lot of, and I've been guilty of this in the past, you know, is that, we have this idea of what this can be, right? And like, oh yeah, you know, if I do this, this, and this, this is the result I'll get. But we're always, we're, we're thinking this thing that's 10 steps down that all nine things are gonna be perfect along the way. Right. Right. And the reality is you already have a data point here that shows you if you buy a flip in this neighborhood, this is a real comp in mine. And here's the other properties you can buy at below that price. Now, instead of starting and saying, I'm hoping all these things line up, I'm hoping I can sell this house for this much. You're saying start with we know the Delta is here in this specific neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Let's find some deals in this specific neighborhood. And when we do, we know the exact path to follow because this path has already been, uh, been blazed. 100%. Yeah. I love the way you worded that. It's, it's a really smart way of looking at it. That's more like outside of the frame of like, okay, data, right? It's mm-hmm. more like just being logical about it. But it's hard to be logical about it when you've got your nine to five, right? You come home, you got to eat dinner, you know, you know, kiss, kiss the family, put them to bed. And then you got an hour and a half to work on your business before you have to go to bed. So you're not waking up groggy the next mm-hmm. morning. And what do they do? Well, they're just like, oh, I need to do something on my business. I need to take action. Something, something, yeah. right? And it's, it's not thinking logically and putting in a good strategy in place. It's. It's action, which is not going to give them a good return on that action. Yeah. And every minute they have is so important because they're only doing it a couple hours a week and maybe a full day on Saturday and a couple hours on Sunday. So if they're wasting their time kind of just floundering around without a, a good strategy in place, it's based off of data, mm-hmm. they're going to fail. Right. They might stumble into a deal. Right. And this is what happens a lot. Right. Maybe they say, well, you know, I live in, I live in Casper, Wyoming. Right, this is a, a town that's up in Wyoming, north of where I live. And I look at that, and I think the last time I saw it was like 30-something deals has closed. Well, there's, there's activity there. 
So someone who lives in Casper is going to say, well, you know what? My guru told me to look in my own backyard first, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, if I can go look at that house with my own two eyes, I'm going to better understand it's a deal and then I'm going to feel warm and fuzzy inside and feel more secure. I'm going to go and do, I, mean, I can do that, right? And so it's more, it, it's more like tangible for them. And maybe they, they do a mailing campaign or they put out some bandit signs and they stumble into a deal like, oh my God, I just made some money. Right? They make five grand. Well, you're not going to be able to build a business on that in that market. Anything that's, that's going to be sustainable long term. Yeah. And so they're, they're going to be like, oh, yeah, I can do this. And then they don't close another deal for six months. And, guess, and then their wife's like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Come on, we got a family here we need to support. Right. Like, get back. Let's get back to reality and do this thing. Whereas if they were more strategic and they said, okay, Indianapolis has 2,100 deals in the last 12 months. Dallas has got 3,800 deals. Philadelphia's got 6,000 deals. That's where I should be spending that valuable time and effort. And Privy can do all that. And Privy does that for you. Gotcha. Shows you specifically which neighborhoods. And then within hours, not months or years, you can become a local market expert and know exactly what percentage of ARV that buyers are buying at, what prices they're buying them at, which neighborhoods are active. And then we show you who those buyers are so that you can pull their information up and contact them and start to build that relationship that you talked about earlier that's so important about yeah. figuring out what their buy box is What's their buying criteria today versus what it was three months ago? Mm -hmm. And all that data is in, inside of Privy. Now, there's, there's quantitative data, right, which is the numbers. Right? They bought it for 300 They sold it for 600 They got it at 50% of the ARV, right? They grossed 300000 mm -hmm. That's That's quantitative data. There's qualitative data, which is, oh, this is the area they, they, they're buying in. Here's the before and after pictures. Here's the level of construction that's adequate for the neighborhood so that you're not leaving money on the table by putting, you know, glass tile in a neighborhood that should only be rental grade rehabs. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of things are really valuable too. And even if you're wholesaling, I mean, you may not think it's valuable for you, but guess who it's valuable to? And buyer. The buyer. Yeah. And for most wholesalers, they tie their assignment fee 100% to just the price. Mm -hmm. Just a delta. That's it. What it should be is how good of a service you provide. Mm -hmm. and, and that service is also tied to the relationship. If you've got a good relationship with a buyer and you provide a good product, which is a, a house that has been thoroughly researched, you've got good comps, you've got links to comparables, you with you know, all the information that shows you that they're good comparables and you give maybe an estimation of the construction cost, um, estimation, you know, maybe a, a range of, of after repair values and you've got a good relationship with them, they're not going to beat you up on your assignment fee, right? They're not going to be, Oh, you don't deserve to make $5,000 on that. You know, they're going to, they're going to want to work with you. So part of like this qualitative data helps a wholesaler to, to build a better product and provide better service where they can actually have a good foundation for building a relationship with that end buyer. Um, one thing I really enjoyed when I was, uh, uh, you know, playing around inside there was that you could see actually the before and after photos of the mm -hmm. flips. So not only have you identified the flips, but now you can demonstrate what actually needs to happen physically, right? It's, I mean, we, were, we were just mentioning a moment ago, right, the qualitative data, but it's a lot easier to understand what the kind of work that's going to be involved. You can just look at the before and after photos. The only thing better would be an actual invoice for the, for the rehab. Exactly. Yeah. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. So we were talking about using the MLS to, what was it? We were saying how to locate uh, the best deals automatically. Mm -hmm. So how exactly does this help me identify the best deals? Right. Yeah. So there's a gap there right now. Right. Before we get to those kinds of deals, if you do that process, if you only did that, mm -hmm. regardless of what your strategy is from that point moving forward, whether you're doing off market foreclosures or you're doing off-market absentee owners or you're going direct to MLS, you're going to get a much better return because now you're looking in an area where the data is to support your values. Right. Right. So if you do a mailing campaign, you spend $10,000 and people are calling you, well, you're going to be able to give those people better offers. Like I was, I ran some numbers at one, some point or another, it was 20 to 30% more. You can, you can offer somebody if it's in the same neighborhood as, as flips, as mm -hmm. opposed to not which means that your, your acceptance rate goes up right? from the simple fact of doing research. 
And that's just off market, right? And then also too, you're going to have a better experience on the disposition side now, because when you go to sell that property and you were working directly with the seller, the buyers are going to, I don't want that property because you have four fix and flips as comps. Like mm -hmm. they can't argue with the ARV on that house. If you have four <laughs> houses that were just flipped last week. Yeah. Right. Right. As opposed to maybe you got one flip and then you got three other homes that are unrenovated or maybe were updated. And then now that's where the disagreement comes in and you have to negotiate with the buyer. But you, gotta argue with the, you have to argue the data. You, just, you do, right. Right. Now, so, so we also have that data, that off-market data. So mm -hmm. we do have foreclosures. We have absentee owners, vacancies, tired landlords. Those are inside of Privy too. Mm -hmm. so you can pull lists, stack lists, do all that sort of thing. But the cool part about that is that um, it isn't just creating a list. Our system is running comps on all of those properties that you're building lists for. So if you pull a list of foreclosures that happened in the last 12 months, we build a comparative market analysis and it updates live with real time MLS driven comparables multiple times per hour. You're saying that right now on a list I have, you can tell me what Privy believes the house is worth. You can up. Yeah. You can find them inside of Privy or you can upload a list. If you've got a list of probates you got from an attorney buddy, you upload it to Privy thousands of properties. Our system will build a comparative market analysis, yeah. pull comparables, and give you that format in that report, live CMA. It also appends all of the public record data, including mortgage information, um, right onto it. Sounds like what Cloud CMA was doing a long time ago. Oh, does it? Yeah. Right. So um, I was just asking because if, if you can automate it mm -hmm. as a user, what I would love is if you could just plug that data into Salesforce, right? If I could just click <laughs> the seller leads, like, there's an the address. All right. Click, all right, Privy says this house is worth this much. Right. I don't know if that's in the pipeline, but I would be, Not exactly, I'd be really grateful if you can make that happen. So there would be a step there to be able to do it. Now, we don't have um, an AVM. Mm -hmm. you know, we don't have a, like a Zestimate like Zillow Got does, it. right? Got it. And there's, part of it is a reason, and mostly is because the Zestimate just has such a bad name to it. I mean, they're a billion-dollar <laughs> company, Zillow is. Yeah, and, no, no one loves Zestimates. Everyone hates it. Right, but they're yeah. a billion dollar company, right? right? So what it tells us is that AVMs don't work. Mm -hmm. So what we can do is by helping you through the process to get to a point where you have a house and all the comps, and we, we do the comping for you, are flipped. Well, that's your, that's your ARV, right? Your ARV is what this, the house down the street was just fixed and flipped and sold for. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we help you be in the best position to have that data available so the the after repair value is a no-brainer. It's right. what that house sold for, right? Within reason, right? Plus or minus a bedroom or a bathroom or something. Now, we can do that for you currently. All you have to do is just, if you, if you export that list from Privy, let's just say it's foreclosures, and it, it has the link in there. It has that, that live CMA link is attached to every single property. Mm -hmm. You just upload that into Salesforce, and now it's there. And you can it. always click it, and it'll take you to the most current version of that updated CMA with the most current comps. Got it. So uh, before we jump into the uh, commercial break, you know, the stuff we're talking about here, this is Privy. So, you know, if you guys are interested in checking that out, it's MLSDisruptors.com. So MLSDisruptors.com. Uh, so you were saying that you can, going back to like identifying deals. So we have the comps, right? So we have the, the, the live comping and we have uh, how to identify um, what's a, uh, a, uh, what we believe the ARV is, how do we get from all that to me identifying quickly what's a good deal or not? Is it off the MLS only or how did like, what is the part what we're identifying here are the good deals? Here's the ones, here are properties you should go buy right now. So this part is, is really cool for us because we actually have a patent pending on this. Okay. So um, we basically have a, like a comparative search it's it's a search where we reverse engineer i wish we could show it but um and people will be able to see it uh, through the link because there's a, a short demo there um, okay um when we plot on the map all of the activity that's there and we show you where the, the properties are being fixed and flipped there's a button that shows up it says find similar active deals so we take all of these successful closed deals mm -hmm. and our system uses those as, as a model for what a deal looks like. Yeah. Remember earlier I told you most people fail with lead gen because they don't know what a deal looks like. Mm -hmm. Well, we show you all that, but then we take that data and we put it in our algorithm 
And then it goes and finds deals that you can buy today that are similar to the ones that just closed. Mm -hmm. And then you just define what discount you want them to be at. So if we decide that in Indianapolis, buyers are buying at 55% of the ARV, and then you click the button, and you adjust it to 55% of the ARV, now that system will continue to look for properties that are at 55% of the ARV based off of what you know about the market, but also through those discussions you have with your buyers to confirm mm -hmm. that that's the case today in today's market. Yeah. So it, it's all algorithmic. So you it's just, identifying the deals. It's identifying the properties that are active on the MLS that the numbers make sense to flip. Right. And the way that that works is because we have a price. Mm -hmm. So when it's listed on the MLS, we can compare the ask price of the house. So let's say it's for sale for 150 grand. And if we tell the system, we need a property to be lower than 55% of the ARV. If that house has a comp that's for sale that sold for 300,000, right? That would put it at 50%. Mm -hmm. Then that property becomes a deal. We flag right. it as a deal. We build a comparative market analysis for it. We send you an email alert with the link. You can click on your phone or on your laptop. It pulls up the CMA. It shows you all of the houses that support that 60% ARV or lower. And then links to all the comps. Yeah. And if they're flipped, and if you've done the process the way we teach you to do it, those houses will be flipped, and then your ARV is right there. Got it. And you said there's a demo there on the website. Mm -hmm. All right, so go to MLSDisruptors.com. So we have a bunch of questions here, but before we go into all the questions, let's take a quick commercial break. And, and then, uh, all right, so let's just go ahead and jump into the questions. So uh, what, what do we got here? Uh, starting off with... Uh, Henry Washington, he says, Privy is the goat. So thank you, Henry, on, on IG. What's up, Henry? Uh, YouTube, Markeisha Smith, Benson's amazing. My team and I really enjoy, uh, really enjoying Privy. So apparently you're already popular with our audience. That's really cool too. Um, so uh, Julian on YouTube, we can find great price deals at asking price using Privy. My question is to you is, is do you think we're able to find lots of competent buyers who'd be willing to buy these deals above list price? So, um, Hypothetically, they found the deal, they locked it up because it's a good deal, mm -hmm. and now they're going to try to sell the property at a price above what's listed on the MLS, if I understand this question correctly. So I must imagine you get this question, you've gotten this question a bunch of times. I have. All right, so let's go with the script, or <laughs> how do you say this? Well, there's a really easy way for me to illustrate why the, the question is, is you can do it. But there's a lot of real-world scenarios where it won't work. So, the re so think about this. Let's say we go out, we find a bunch of buyers, and well, one of the cool things that we can tell in Privy is that, well, is a buyer willing to buy something from the MLS? So if we look at the house they fixed and flipped and sold last week, you say they bought from the MLS, they sold it for this much money, and they got it at 60% of the ARV, right? And then we talk to those people, and then we're like, hey, you closed that deal last month on Main Street, looks great, by the way. You know, I'm an investor in the area. I come across properties a lot that, you know, don't meet my buy box or I just don't have the bandwidth for. Um, is, is this kind of what you're looking for? And they'd be like, yeah, you know what? We're, we're going up to about 58% of the ARV now. Um, but if you can find something that's lower than 58% of the ARV in this neighborhood, we want to see it. Right. So now you've got some direction from the buyer mm -hmm. and what their buying criteria is. And then you're like, all right, cool. So Looks like you also bought this thing from the MLS. You have any issues with MLS deals? Is that okay? Like, no, we'll do MLS deal. We have no problem with that. Awesome, cool. Well, sometimes we come across properties and they're such great, amazing deals, right? And if I could find a property that was at say 50% of the ARV and I had to get it at slightly at asking price or a slightly above, is that something you'd still be interested in? As long as all your other buying criteria made sense. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be like, yeah, I take a look at it, right? So part of, of what I said there is you're basically, you're, you're prepping them for the scenario down the road when that's going to happen. Right. Now, let's just say, okay, we, we run a search. We find a property that's in privy at 40% of the area. And you can find those all, all day as long as you use our reverse RA strategy. And let's say it was at 40% of the ARV. Let's say um, you could get it for 80 grand and the ARV was 200 grand. All right. Um, and that makes sense at 40%. Well, that should be a deal to this M buyer. Even if I have to pay um, 
you know, 85 for it. Mm-hmm. Or let's say I got it for 80. I mean, let's say I got it for asking price and I want to put $5,000 on it. And now this, this property is at 43% of the ARV. Well, why shouldn't the buyer buy it if they just told us they'd go to 58%? Right. There's no logical reason except for ego. Exactly. Ego is what gets in the way of deals being done. And you can get around a lot of that ego by building relationships, by providing a really good service, right? Where you have all the data there yep. and then vetting them out ahead of time, like making sure they know that those could come. And also too, spending time with people who don't have a problem with that. Eventually you're going to figure out who will and won't do that. All right. But if a buyer is really motivated by deal flow and they can get a property at 30% of the ARV, but they have to pay $20,000 over what I got it for. Mm-hmm. And I got it at ask price. Well, who gives a crap as long as it's still a good deal. Right. It and shouldn't matter. I love that you're bringing all these things up, right? As long as you provide a good service um, and, and the values there. And, um, you know, we, the, the ego component, I think that the, the big thing we talk about again, you know, with the Dispo sales training is ensuring you understand what the reason is behind them buying properties. Mm-hmm. And if the reason is there right? I want to, uh, I, I want to make enough money so I can take my family on vacations. Whatever they tell you, it is right. Quit my nine to five. Okay, so is that still important? Because right now it sounds like that's not as important, right. right? That should be able to diffuse the ego. The other thing I really enjoy what you did there, right, is you handled all the objections in the initial conversation. Yep. Not later, right? It's like, hey, you know, we come across deals doesn't fit my criteria. Want me to send this to you? Okay, sometimes they're off the MLS. Is that an issue? Okay, sometimes they're on MLS, and you're going to be paying over MLS. Is that an issue? And they said no to all three things, so now when it comes up, hey, I don't understand. Like, we, you, Benson, you and I talked. You, you, you said mm-hmm. as long as it hit your criteria, you're okay. Right. What did I miss? Absolutely. Yeah. And then you do the takeaway. Right. Hey, and you're is- like, oh, well, that's fine. I mean, if this deal isn't for you, I've got lots of other people that want it. Mm-hmm. Are we on the same page here, or should I give it to somebody else? Right. Fantastic. So look at that. Look at how... Deep we went on that question. Thank you, Julian. Um, all right. So on YouTube, uh, AI entrepreneur, any future updates currently on uh, currently or for the future to find out attorneys, title companies are closing flips and creative deals. So specifically, he put a list here: sub to innovation, seller finance, private notes, etc. Um, nothing in, in that realm right now having to do with title companies or. Um... I feel, or, you know, other kind of service providers that are having to do with the transactions themselves that, that, mm-hmm. that data doesn't really exist in the public format where we can just on scale, grab it. It's going to be more like a crowdsourcing scenario where we have a community and maybe people are like, Hey, here's my title company. Here's the, here's my contractor. Here's my agents. You know, we can, we'll, we know who the agents are and that's mm-hmm. actually something we, we are building where you're going to be able to search inside of privy and say, show me every agent that's represented a fix and flipper or every agent that's uh, investor friendly in this zip code. Yeah. That's huge. That's going to be coming. And then the other thing that we're adding into privy is short-term rental data as well as more long-term rental data. And so you'll be able to run a search that says, show me every agent that's represented a person that bought a a short-term rental in this neighborhood. Yeah. Right. And so you'll be very specific on who you want to work with, but that data we have, right? So there isn't anything that I can connect a lawyer or a title company or something to a property. Yeah, the only thing I can think of, and this is really Maricopa County specific, this is yeah. definitely not nationwide, is like it's other, right? Was this cash, conventional, VA, FHA, or other? That's <laughs> really all right. there is. And that's usually not MLS data because that's usually off-market data. It's uh, true. Right? Most people doing creative deals are, are, are not going through MLS. And Well, and we've got the off-market, right? We've right. got all of that public record and county record data. It's yeah. associated with it, but I don't, what do you mean? What would the attorney would be in there somehow? What do you mean? Well, th- when they record it, uh, again, this is the county specific, right? So like when we record here, we got to go, th- there's an affidavit of value and like what kind of, well, how was the transaction process, right? So that's a mm. recorded document, but I don't know how you can do that at a scale. Uh, and the other thing too, you were saying earlier at the very beginning, how MLS is not this holy grail everyone thinks it is. And to your point, right? If it, you can find all the agents that represented a property that turned into an Airbnb, right? right? This is you cross-referencing multiple uh, resources. This is not MLS data, that's the value you guys are talking about you're providing. Totally, yeah, we, we definitely want to, you know, connect more dots when we bring in this, you know, air short-term rental data. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's some good products out there right now that 
take you as far as being able to identify what the, you know, the short-term rental rates are and vacancy rates. And you can see some information about that. And that's where they stop. We're going to be able to say, okay, cool. Well, you've done that research. We're going to use our reverse engineering model, our, mm -hmm. our patent penny to me, like, show me every property I can buy today that gives me the same return on investment as that short-term rental that's down the street. Yeah. And then the algorithm kicks in and goes and finds that property and analyzes it for you. For me, it's scary at times of how much we can do with data. Uh, it is. I mean, I'm still going to take advantage of it, but it's still scary at times. <laughs> uh, on YouTube, uh, I'm going to completely butcher his name. I think it's Ifinyi. Uh, are you able to text sellers when driving for deals inside of Privy? No. So that's a, actually a good distinction to make right now is that I mean, there's some good products out there that do marketing. Mm -hmm. We don't consider ourselves a marketing platform. We're more of deal analyzation and tracking. So if, it, if you want to go and market, we'll help you build a list. You can, you can pull lists from Privy and you can stack them and you can you know, get the CMA link. But if you want to go and skip trace, um, if you want to do an autom automatic redial or what's a dialer thing, mm -hmm. um, if you want to you know, do any of those kind of marketing type activities, then those are other platforms, at least right now. Yeah. Um, and it's good, right? Because you're, you're, you got a core focus. You know what you want and you're doing mm -hmm. what you're doing. What's up, what's inside your strength zone. So on IG, uh, Majid, uh, this is gonna be a fun question for you. Uh, what is the difference between Privy and PropStream? Well, similar to what I, I just mentioned, right? So PropStream does a lot of things. Well, um, I, I would consider them more of a, like a lead generation type platform mm -hmm. where you're, you're almost focused entirely on off market type, uh, activities. You want to get directly to the seller. Um, that's what they do that well. We, we have similar data sets. Um, they only have third party MLS data. They don't have any direct to MLS. Um, we've got third party MLS as well, but in areas where we've got direct to MLS that overrides the third party. So, mm -hmm. you know, a, a prop stream level experience would be very similar to ours in Billings, Montana right now, right? Because we've got similar data sets. You could pull a list with them. You could pull a list with us. Um, we don't do any marketing. So if, if, if they have like a, a ringless voicemail service or if they got like a text messaging service, that would be what they would do. We don't do any of that right now. Um, the, main, the main difference from us is the direct to MLS data, the reverse REA strategy. We track all that investment activity. It's that local market education. Like being able to see with your own two eyes that before and after picture where you can see what a house looked like before what it looks like after what percentage of ARV did they buy it at? What was their gross margin? Where are those hot areas? Which neighborhood should I be investing in today? Yeah. Or looking for deals in because there's a lot of buyers there. Like all the ingredients are present to put a deal together. Being more strategic and intentional about where you look for deals instead of just kind of just doing the same old thing, which is what I think a lot of people do when they use a prop stream is like, okay, I'm just going to pull a foreclosure list where I live. Mm -hmm. because that's all I could figure out through YouTube university. And then it doesn't work. You know, they spend, you know, $500 on a mailing campaign with no intention of doing it, you know, as many times as it takes to get a deal done. And now they're burned out of the, right. of the, of the business. You mentioned Billings, Montana, very unique area. Mm -hmm. uh, is it because Montana is a non-disclosure state or is it because of the MLS access? Um, I picked it because it's an obscure market okay. that doesn't have a ton of investor activity. So the reason I'm asking this question is mm -hmm. when we expanded to uh, Oklahoma, we had some challenges doing market analyses right. because it's a non-disclosure state or right. New Mexico. One of those two, we had some major challenges. Heck, it might be both states. I don't remember anymore. It's been a while. But we struggled doing CMAs in non-disclosure states. Right. For someone that's in a non-disclosure state, does Privy help them with that challenge? 100%. Okay. Because yeah. you guys have access to the MLS directly. Because we have access to, to MLS data. MLS data. Because I know like for us, the only way we could get that data is if we had a licensed agent run the comps for us. So you're saying that because you guys, are, even if, you get, if it's a non-disclosure state, since you guys have buy-in from the MLS, now you have more data that you can work with. Right. Well, the whole idea is to enable relationships with, with agents and, and investors, right? So mm -hmm. when an investor 
wants to work inside of Privy, they likely want to use agents too, right? And this is actually a new thing. And, you know, you know, Ryan Zolan and Jamil, and there's some people who have kind of been on the front edge of like this agent outreach mm -hmm. type um, approach, um, which is why I, I love, you know, with Privy is kind of in the, we're in the perfect place right now yeah. because we were able to kind of connect the dots. So we've got all these agents here. They want to work with wholesalers. They just want to work with dumb wholesalers. Right. Who don't know how to run comps, who mm -hmm. don't know how to do the things, and they don't want to waste their time. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a lot of really bad wholesalers that have ruined it for the rest of the people out there that know what they're doing. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, through this process, we're going to be able to mend that. Is it that reputation? I think it goes both ways. I it think, does. I think there are a lot yeah. of wholesalers that hate working with dumb realtors too. Totally. Right. So I think the 80 20 mm -hmm. rule applies on both sides. Or maybe it's like, you know, 95 5 rule applies for like both sides. It really is. Yeah. And one of the goals, and this is something we will be doing, is is creating a, a certification to help both wholesalers and agents work together. Mm -hmm. um, but we actually plan on creating a, a CE cl type class for agents yeah. to be able to become more fiduciaries and investor focused agents who know how to run the numbers who understand how to work with wholesalers, who understand how to use our data to be able to track markets and provide better service to their clients. Um, that's something that's going to happen. And so yeah. maybe we can level out the playing field a little bit there. Yeah, that's They're, fascinating. So they work together better. That's awesome that you guys are doing that. Uh, facility you two, what's the best way that I can use Privy to find off-market deals? Um, well, it's through the reverse REI strategy. Mm -hmm. So you really want to make sure you are looking for off-market deals in the proper neighborhoods. Don't look for deals where you live. Don't look for deals where you went to school or where Uncle Joe lives. You look for deals in the area where you know the ingredients are to build the deal. And those ingredients are buyers and after repair value comps. So houses that have been fixed and flipped that you can use to prove after repair value and help you be able to better understand what a deal is. Yeah. So if you know what the ARV is of a three bedroom, two bath house in 80234 in Denver, that's 1200 square feet. When you go and you market there, and a buyer responds back to one of your ringless voicemails, and they say, well, what will you buy my house for? Well, you look at like, oh, well, that's a 3 2 1200 square foot house in 80234. The ARV is 200,000. I'll give you 100,000 mm -hmm. or whatever percentage is based off of what you know your buyers want. So if your buyer said, I want 60%, you're like, oh, cool. Well, I'll give you 120, I'll give you 115,000 for your house. Right. Because all, everything you know from learning that investor activity, We'll show you what those off-market deals are and what we should be offering the, the seller. Yeah. And I like, you know, you brought up, you know, Ryan, uh, Zolan, and Jamil, right? You're, you're hoping to marry this community with a certification. I hope you can make it work because I've tried for four or five years now, and I've made zero progress on that. I hope you can make it work. Well, maybe we can put our heads together on something. I want to know what didn't work. They hate each other. <laughs> it's, it's oil and water. Uh, there's a... Uh, you know, um, I hate Apple products, right? I have an iPhone, peer pressure, all this other stuff, right? Um, there is this like massive elitism from iPhone users to Android users, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the, the bubbles, right. right? The green bubbles. So somehow that elitism exists on both sides of the industry, right? The it realtors does. look down on the wholesalers and the wholesalers look down on the realtors. We all do the same exact thing. We just hit different audiences. but. Like uh, we were saying much earlier, right? You were a killer uh, a realtor, right? Back in the day. Mm -hmm. That's the same thing as a dispo rep. A realtor and a buyer's agent and dispo rep are the same exact guy. An acquisition manager and a listing agent is the same exact guy. They both got TCs, right? Right. It's the same thing, but they just dress a little differently. I guess the way I would look <laughs> at it probably because they're so similar, right? We focus on what we're different than what we're saying, right? It might be like, for example, uh, in parts of Ireland, right? Protestants and Catholics, can you and I tell the difference? No way. We can right. never tell the difference. They hate each other, right? Uh, there's parts of Europe where like that border, you, don't, you and I don't know where that border is, but they know. Oh yeah, they know. Right? Physically, you can't tell the difference, but they know. And I think it's a lot about education too, like setting expectations. Yeah. Like if they just would sit down and, and just like figure out like where the line is drawn, like 
how do you want to work together? What's a winning scenario for you? What's a winning scenario for me? Mm-hmm. Right. And so if an agent, if a, if a wholesaler now is like, just don't waste this agent's time. Like, yes, we know no one's going to make money until the deal is closed, but be respectful of someone's time and take on some of the onus. And this is, I think where I think a lot of leveling of the playing field can happen with privy is that it takes the, the onus of a lot of the process that the real estate agent owned before now off their plate and the wholesaler or the investor can get more involved in the process by yep. comping their own properties out. They know what a deal likes looks like they can find their own deals. And so now it's not as so much on one party, which is where I think a lot of the tension came from. Mm-hmm. Now when they're they're they've leveled out, they're like, okay, we need each other now. Right. Especially now. Right. Yeah. So again, I hope you figure this out. Uh, Claudio on YouTube, what are you seeing for KPIs uh, to a deal? 50 agents daily, five offers daily. What are you seeing on the privy mm-hmm. backend, I guess, that what kind of activity or KPIs specifically lead to deals? That's interesting. We actually don't have the ability to track those KPIs, and I personally don't do enough activity to give any sort of advice on what a working, like a good model would be. Um, you know, we've got lots of users. I bet you there's people in the chat right now that have a, a good model, but I think, I, I wish I could give some advice on that. I just really don't know. And I've, I've heard the spectrum. I've heard 50 offers a day, you know, to get, you know, a certain number of deals and then, you know, closing three or four deals a month. I, I just don't know. Yeah. The non answer though. I like it. Uh, so on YouTube, the real JC, please focus on building better relationships between realtors and wholesalers slash investors. As someone who's licensed and familiar with both sides, it's a huge problem. Both sides uh, act like they know it all. So I think that's a great, great point there. So mm-hmm. um, going back to this, you know, uh, you, you solved a problem, right, with, with Privy. Uh, when you and, was it Scott, right, had this epiphany Scott, mm-hmm. in 2010, yep. is Privy looking exactly like you, you thought in 2010? That's a really good question. I don't, I think it is looking very similar to what we thought it would be. We've, we just have a lot more resources now to execute it and it's, it's much cleaner now. And it, it, we hear so much good positive feedback about the, the user experience and mm-hmm. the user interface. Just like, it's just like, it's so visual. And it, when people hear data, they think, oh my God, I'm gonna get a spreadsheet. Exactly where gonna, my head went. Or I'm going to get like a line graph, yeah. right? And then this is, I have to somehow interpret that to get value out of it and then make a, a decision and then take action, which it, that's, you, you can't, I mean, that's what like stock trading is, right? Mm-hmm. But with Privy, a lot of it is so visual where you can look at a map and you can see like these, these, heat, these heat clusters of like where activity is. And it's like, oh, I go look there, mm-hmm. right? I don't have to look at a, a big spreadsheet and a bunch of stuff going on. Or, you know, we talked about the before and after pictures. Yeah. You can understand what drives value in a neighborhood when you see this house where it's been trash and there's hoarder situation going on and you got this beautiful home on the right. And then right below that, it says, okay, I bought it. They bought it for this much. They sold it for this much. They got it at 62% of the ARV. And here's the buyer. Like, we can just connect all the dots for you so gracefully. Yeah. To where we take a lot of the guesswork out of it. And it's, there's so there's so much fewer mistakes, I believe, if they leverage the way that we designed it to be used. Yeah, well, I love it, right? Again, you're, you're filling in that gap uh, that there was a hole that, yeah, just go get data, go get leads, go take action, right? Things that we, we talk about on the show, right? There's nothing wrong with, with that message. You're, you're, you're filling in a gap for like, okay, here's what you need to know in order to succeed mm-hmm. after you've taken those steps. Right. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, what is your why? Good question. I think my why is I've been, I've been grinding so hard for so long. It's like, I, there's no way for me to turn back. Like, like I've burnt the ships at the beach. Yeah. And, um, you know, I don't have my own family. I don't have like a wife and children, but I've got family. I got people I love and that I want to take care of. Um, that, that work really hard. They just don't have the kind of ROI that I know I can get. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I want to build a legacy. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, 
unfortunately, this past Sunday, right? You and I were, were supposed to talk a couple different times. Mm-hmm. And I had to blow you off because of <laughs> my wife and kids. I felt bad about that. But at least I updated you. But our why is a, a line, yeah. right? Like, our why's are similar. It sounds like it's, it's family. It's, it's taking care of the ones we love. Yeah. Um, not how much money I got. Right. Or, or will it get or, or anything like that. You know, it's, it's interesting you brought that up. I have not heard one, one person say, like, my why is X dollar amount. Um, what is your biggest struggle right now? Oh boy. It's, I would say it's bandwidth. So our, we're growing pretty well right now. And, um, so it's kind of keeping up with the growth Mm -hmm. and making sure we got the right butts in the seats so that we can manage the growth effectively and not grow too fast, but have kind of a, a managed growth where we can make sure everybody's getting the attention they need. And we've got a good product that does what it's supposed to do. Um, and making sure we have the, the people that can help do that. That's what, that's what we're working on right now. And, you know, we've got several new developers on team. We've got new customer ser- service people. Um, that's the, the biggest challenge right now is, is managing all that. And, and I'm not even involved with that at a high level. Like we've got my partner, Scott, that's doing that. We just hired a new um, you know, director of operations. And so people who have C-level experience at like corporations, mm-hmm who who've done it you know at a high level not yeah. from you know a kind of a startup environment where we i just hack every day and i just you know grind right and who's figure it out who's helping you with all that uh we are so we've we've hired some um like recruiter type companies mm-hmm. um we've got on our um, our technical side we've got a, a fractional cto we, have, we found you know fractional type people who can come in who are high level experience and can do those hirings and make sure we got the right butts in the seats um, and advisors. Uh, we've been pretty fortunate with people who are um, advisors who have come along and, and love what we're doing. They love the product. They love us as people and they want to help. Yeah. That's awesome. How do you stay motivated? How do I stay motivated? It's probably, I just, I just don't want to fail. Is it a fear of failure? I don't like failure is unacceptable. What, what, is this different parts of like, I don't want to fail. There is. Um, I don't know. I think at this point now we have enough people who are, who, who've kind of attached themselves to the product and, and our success. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and some of it isn't like directly, but just when I think about the people who use our product every day, who, who pay us they give us money to use this system yeah like it needs to do what it's supposed to do right and me coming here and saying all these exciting things like it's gonna go and find deals like if it doesn't do that then i'm not doing my job right right so what what i do and what our staff does and our developers we just got an amazing team and it's growing we just want to make sure that it we can deliver on on what we say we can do and that requires a lot of time and effort and I mean there's there's effort and there's time but there's also like investment like I'm I'm emotionally and in, 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 soulfully invested in this project yeah Got it. Like, it, it, like it's gonna work and, so I see a lot and of there's passion. no chance it can fail so I see a lot of passion here so is yeah. there anything behind this passion is there an instance where something didn't work and like you took it like really hard there's I mean, I, I told you about clout. Like, clout right. didn't work. Right. Right. I put a lot of time and effort and money in that project, and it didn't work. And you know, I most of us have failed business projects. Oh, yeah. I right? get more than a handful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's it, there. Definitely is is a very big passion to to not fail, but also succeed. And I I want to get to a point where I nothing. Any decision I make isn't based off of how much money I have in the bank. Mm-hmm. Like I just want to do what I want to do, right? And I want um, you know, all the people around me to be able to do the same thing. So you know, we have a lot of listeners here that you know they might be facing adversity, particularly right now, right? And you've mm-hmm. gone through it with clout. Were there some lessons you learned there that someone listening now, or actually even not just clout, right? But like. I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here, I promise, right? But 2007, 2010, right? Like you had to give a lot of those properties back. Oh, yeah. Right? That's probably a really tough pill to swallow, especially after your partner stole all your money. 
Yep. Right? So you face a lot of adversity. So for someone right now that's going through challenges, what message or what lessons could you share with them that they can take, uh, take to heart today? I think probably the most important thing is, well, two things. It's really get in tune with yourself, like who you are and, and who you are and what you tell, your inner talking. Like what, what are you saying to yourself mm-hmm. every day? Right? It, I was just talking with a friend of mine. His name is uh, Andrew Schlag. He's a guy in, in the business. He's done a lot of really cool things. We were talking about, he's creating this group around putting new people together who have similar interests and they're all working toward a collective um, you know, goal. And so being around other people that have the same struggles that you have yeah. um, is part of it. But also like that inner game, the inner game of like knowing who you are and what you're, what you can, what you want to accomplish. And, knowing your value and your worth and not beating yourself, not beating yourself up over every little thing and knowing that there's a lesson to be learned in every mistake. Um, like those kinds of things like, are the important thing. And now it's, it's ever more common to talk about like mental health and just making sure you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. Those kinds of things. Yeah. And I think that's one of the things that is e- always easy to overlook. I mean, I, def- I definitely feel like, you know, now versus like a decade ago, it's taken a lot more seriously, but Oh yeah. I still think probably could be taken a little bit more uh, seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you measure success? That's another thing I'm not great at is setting like measurable goals, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's something I'm working on. Um, I don't know. I think it's, it's a mindset. I, I think you can be successful and not be rich. Right. It's more about like you being comfortable with where you're at in your life and being content. So I think you can be successful with knowing that like you accomplished a certain number of things in your life and you overcame adversity. And like a lot of success too, has to start with like where you started, mm-hmm. not just where you're at currently, but like if you grew up and you you're from a broken home and you were poor and you have, you know, 99% chance of failure and being in prison or whatever, but you end up being a productive part of society and like, you know, like having like a good job and a family and, you know, you're, you know, you go to and you, you know, give back or you give to charity, like that's success. It is. Absolutely. Right. And it doesn't have to be like you started from the very bottom, but it, it really is, is like what makes you happy at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. If you are happy and you're content and you make people around you happy too, like that's successful. Yeah. A lot of that's a lot easier if you have, you know, if there's money involved. Sure. It solves a lot of problems. But not all of them. Not all of them. Yeah. What is your superpower? Uh, my superpower. Let me think here for a second. Uh, I think I'm, I'm good at like, building rapport with people, like, like, like sitting down with somebody or just meeting somebody from the very first time and just like, getting like a good connection, like right away. Yeah. Like I, it's just talking with somebody, figuring out where there's some common ground and building rapport and building, like starting the path down that like, no like, and trust mm-hmm. pa- quicker than the, the no average person. I think yeah. I, I'm good at that. Yeah. And that makes total sense. I mean, going back earlier, right. If you were a stellar buyer's agent, that is one of the requirements <laughs> of being a great buyer's agent. Right. What was Scott say your superpower? Wow. Um, I think you would say it's my superpower, but also maybe the opposite. Like, what is who is Superman? What's the opposite of the Kryptonite? Yeah, you know, weakness. Yeah, it's um no, his uh bizarro oh, yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah, bizarro superman, yeah. Like so but like the bizarro like is like I can I can do a bunch of things really good. Like I I wear a lot of hats right now. Mm-hmm. Um but that turns in, that's also a bad thing, right? So like, Benson, you're, you're, you're doing too many things, like focus, right? Right On one thing. And I'm like, well, I, there's all these other things that have to get done. Who's going to do those? Right? So I think that he would be like, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a curse too. Well, it's a yin and yang. Yeah. Yeah. Often your, your, your weaknesses and strengths are two, same sides or two sides of the same coin. Yeah, it really yeah. is. Because I have that same problem too. Right. I can do a lot of things really well. Problem is I don't do one thing. Right. Yeah, no, I totally get that one. 
Uh, how did you learn your greatest lesson? Greatest lesson. Um, man. I don't know. I think that uh, it, it's just like things happen in your life. Like Obviously, it's negative things, right, that we identify. You know, just making sure that you're spending time with people you care about. Mm -hmm. um, when my mom died. Yeah. Just those events just really just, you know, hit home. So, so, what so right now, like with, with my why being my family, like that lesson was really driven home by knowing my mom was gone. Yeah. Um, what did you, what behaviors did you change? Like, you know, after that, it was being much more intentional about reaching out to people and connecting, like just knowing that, cause we always think, Oh, well I'll talk to them next time. You know, there's plenty of time. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. There's always time. We can, we can figure it out. But there's not. There's and, not. We, and we don't know how long, like, how much time we have or, or how valuable that time is. Like, like you might have 10 years of time with somebody, but maybe you only see them once a year mm -hmm. for, for an hour, like at a dinner, right? Like, so you literally only have 10 hours of time with somebody if you know that they're going to be here for another 10 years. And that's if you know that you're going to be, have them for 10 years. It's yeah. so like if you live away from your family and you go home and you visit, like right now we're in the holidays. A lot of people are going to see their family and they might spend a half a day with them. And it's like, oh yeah, I got 10 years with this person, but is it really 10 years? Yeah, or is it know. five times 10? You, you got that many hours of time with that person. Yeah. It's different. It's very different. I measure, I measure it differently now. Yeah, no, that's a powerful, powerful lesson. Uh, what book have you gifted more than any other? I don't give books. Yeah. Is there something that you, is there a book? Is there a favorite book? Is there a resource you'd like directing people to? You know, I mean, obviously I would go besides back real estate instructors podcast. Dad, poor like dad. Yeah, exactly. I got my goodie bag. Yeah. Um, we're getting ready to dig into that one. Um, you know, I was, I was for a long time. I was really into the rich dad, poor dad mm -hmm. stuff. I bought all of them. Right. Um, the books, the courses, the events, the or, books, okay. the books. Um, and that's the one I probably told people to go read the most and then think grow rich. Mm -hmm. Um, and that one actually I've given away, um, links, a friend of mine, um, bought like a license to it or something. And I was able to kind of share that as well. Oh yeah. I've seen that. I think, um, it, I think Matt Andrews has that where like, you can just give like his version. Right. Think and grow rich. It's really interesting. Right? Yeah. It's a really brilliant move. Um, so uh, I want you to think about the message you want to leave the listeners with. Well, I'll make a couple of quick announcements. Mm -hmm. uh, guys, if you got value today, please like, subscribe, share, comment. If you guys are interested in what Benson's talking about as far as uh, Privy, go to MLSDisruptors.com. And we do have 10 days left in our holiday promotion for our uh, sales products. You want to make 2023 even better. I highly recommend checking that out. And don't forget to join us tomorrow for Pardon the Disruption. So what last thoughts would you like to leave everybody with? Uh, well, I would say that in the last downturn, I told you I was, I was unprepared. And um, I think I'm way better prepared this time. And there are some people that are in the business now that haven't been as long as I was. I, I think I'm more prepared now because I had the time to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't want anybody to take this time lightly, how much of an opportunity this is. Like if you, we already know how much little time we have to spend on our business during normal times, right? Evenings, weekends, you know, hours per week. And if we think that there's going to always going to be, oh, I can just go and I can, I can write offers next week or I can call next week or whatever. We got a window here, a very, and I don't know how big this window is going to be, but if you don't start preparing yourself now and figuring out what your niche is, and if it's foreclosures, like you go out and you learn every little thing there is to know about a foreclosure in your target county and just know it back to front, every little thing and become an expert and then take action. Yeah. So recognizing that this is an unprecedented time it hasn't happened for over a decade and 
there are still a lot of people who are sitting on the sidelines who are uncertain about what's going to happen. That's okay. That's an opportunity for people who are action takers. So if you can take action, you get comfortable and you can use, you know, data, maybe like a system like Privy to get more confident in your numbers, really understand what a deal is in your target market and then start taking action because this is, we're, we're going to go down further. Mm -hmm. We haven't hit bottom yet. Right. I don't know when that's going to happen, but that could be too late to actually go and start because at that point, everybody jumps in. Yeah. Don't wait for the right time. Right. Then you're going to have all that competition. So there's a really good opportunity here to just really take action, know what opportunity is there for you and, and start making some money. Like this is now like, see, there's, there's never been an easier time, a better time to do real estate with the democratization of data automation, software tools, the, the prices, everyone's price competing. And so it's cheaper than it's ever been before. The opportunity with the downturn in the market mm -hmm. and prices right now, it's insane. Yep. Awesome. If someone wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, they can email me. Um, you can email us at success at teamprivy.com. Um, also, they can call the office. It's 720 Eight one five zero zero three four, um, or just uh, you know connect with me on on Instagram or uh, TikTok. Yeah, if it's TikTok? a Benson TikTok. TikTok. Yeah. I'm shocked. Shocked over here. Well, well how come? Because you're like my age. <laughs> I'm not huge on there. <laughs> this is one of my goals for 2023: is to do more social. Yeah. And no, so, I love it. I'm doing TikTok too, right? So uh, yeah, it's just. Always still shocking, right? To find other, the other, find other peers on TikTok. So I'm still figuring it out, like where my place is in that whole thing. Yeah. When it was just like dancing and all that sort of thing, and Gary Vee was like, everybody needs to get on TikTok. And I was like, I'm not doing anything on there. Yeah. But when I learned it's like a really good platform for distribution of education, mm -hmm. that's when I was, I, I bought into it. Yeah. I, I got in the, just a little bit later than I should have. I was waiting, right? Kind of talking about timing, right? right. I was waiting just a little bit longer. There was a window where, like, all right, this is transition from dancing to education, and I wait a little bit longer, so I don't have as much uh, uh, reach on there as much as I would like. So, awesome! Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. it. Thank you guys all for watching. See you guys all later. Shout out to Steve Train. Jump on the Steve Train. We real estate disruptors.